So for this lecture, we're going to talk about the 70s. This uh, kind of kicks off the end of the Cold War that we have been studying now for quite a while. And the 70s, moving away from kind of that time period of the civil rights and the Vietnam War, the 70s is a somewhat controversial era in U.S. history because it's kind of that time period where the United States seemed to be in decline. And that's kind of going to be what you're going to look at um, was this such a tumultuous era? Was this an era of decline in the United States? So the objectives, um, what we want to do mostly, we want to understand these two people. We want to understand President Ford and President Carter. They're going to be our primary focuses. Um, they're the two that pretty much run the country during the 70s. And then we're going to look at um, two different pieces, how the United States dealt with its foreign policy and how the United States dealt with its domestic policy. Remember, foreign policy is dealing with things outside of the United States. Domestic policy is dealing with things inside of the United States. So the vocab for today, uh, the really, really, really important two that I'm going to have you focus on are detente and stagflation. Um, so stagflation is the main domestic policy. Um, so I'll put a D up there for domestic, and then detente is the main foreign policy issue. So stagflation is where um, you have inflation, which is what we're going through right now in the country. The, there's too much money, so money is not worth as much. Um, but usually with stagflation, uh, it kind of breaks the old mold of when you have high inflation, you usually have high employment. Um, with stagflation, the economy had not been growing. There was actually unemployment and inflation at the same time, so it really didn't make sense. And we'll get into that more. Detente, we've talked about this a little bit. This is where the United States and the Soviet Union try to decrease the tension between each other and make it so that the Cold War is kind of less hot than it had been. I remember, they still can't fight each other, but there were lots of proxy wars going on. One of those proxy wars is down here, the Sandinistas. Um, they were fighting a U.S. supported dictatorship in Nicaragua all throughout the 70s. That's going to be important. And then we're going to get into conservatism. Um, conservatism is this idea that America needs to return to like traditional values. You can kind of see it as like the golden age of the 50s. And it's going to be really important, especially after the 70s with the election of Ronald Reagan. So the 70s, this video just kind of goes over it, but we're gonna we're just gonna skip that. I'm not gonna show the whole thing. All right, so to start, we have President Ford. So we talked about Nixon, you read about Nixon, and uh, a very controversial president. After he resigns, President Vice President Ford takes over. Um, he faced a really troubled country, is the only way to put it. Um, he has some major issues. Number one, he has to recover from Watergate, that scandal where President Nixon eventually resigned from. Um, he has to figure out a way for the country to kind of get past that. The economy is absolutely collapsing. They're going. The United States is going through a recession. This is where that stagflation comes in. There is um, high unemployment in the country and there is a huge amount of inflation. So people don't have a job and prices are going up. The last piece is the American public after Vietnam, all the issues and riots throughout the late 60s and into the early 70s, um, the Watergate scandal, they just distrust the government. The government is seen as something that's bad. It's not seen as something that can solve problems, and he has to find a way to kind of fix that. So the first thing he does, um, the initial thing, is he pardons Nixon. And a pardon is just where if you committed a crime, that crime is then like null and void. The president can do it anytime they want. Uh, the reason he says that he's going to do this is this key piece right here. He said that Watergate had def divided the nation and it needed to kind of just be over. So instead of Nixon going to trial and possibly going to jail, he pardons him. He says Watergate is over. We're going to move past it. It's super unpopular with the American people because a lot of people wanted to see Nixon actually go on trial and possibly go to jail, but it kind of did make the country decide, okay, Watergate's done. We're moving into a new era. His biggest thing that he has to focus on, though, is stagflation. 
Um, he has to get the economy running again. The main reason that stagflation was happening is for some reason, the economy wasn't growing anymore. Um, the U.S. economy, if you remember back to the 50s and 60s, was very, very strong. We were pretty much supplying the world with everything. In the 70s, it just stops. What this causes is it causes inflation to rise as well. So your money was worth less and there were less jobs available for people to have. That's a major problem. Another major issue he faces is the, uh, the oil embargo. So the oil embargo um, starts because Arab nations refuse to sell the United States oil due to our support of the Israelis during their wars against the Arabs. Um, we imported most of our oil from places like Saudi Arabia, especially Iran back then. And they just say, we're not going to sell you oil if you continue to support Israel. Um, what this does is if you look at this picture over here, there began to be actual limits on how much gasoline you could get. And that like the pumps would run out. Um, we have a bunch of like hippies up here eating lunch, having a picnic on a freeway because there's just no gasoline. Um, all this results in a really bad U.S. economy, an economy that is essentially collapsing. So Ford comes up with the WIP Inflation Now or the WIN program. Um, this campaign essentially asked Americans to spend less money to try and beat inflation. And if you know Americans, we are not big on not spending money. It's an absolute failure. It makes Ford look bad and it kind of makes him not popular with the rest of the country. Foreign policy wise, um, Ford decides to continue detente. And this is important because he wants to focus on kind of the, um, the domestic policy of the United States. He doesn't really want to focus on the Soviet Union. He wants to bring the tensions down with the Soviet Union. So the two important pieces are gonna be Helsinki and the SALT II Treaty. So the Helsinki Accords is signed with the Soviet Union, and it's a document that declares basic human rights. Like humans have a right to um, worship the religion they want, general freedom to go where they want, freedom of speech, basic things like that. This is actually big because the Soviet Union didn't believe in human rights. And getting them to sign this is kind of, you can kind of think of it as like a trap that the United States has set. It allows us to criticize the Soviet Union. The bigger one, and the one that you definitely should know, is SALT II. So SALT II is a nuclear arms control treaty. This actually limits and destroys certain nuclear weapons. This has been the goal of all the talks between the United States and the Soviet Union for decades. Reduce the amount of nuclear weapons of, in both of their arsenals so nuclear war is less likely to happen. The issue that we're going to see... And this comes all the way in the late 70s and 79 is going to be the Senate does not ratify it because of the invasion of Afghanistan. So even it's negotiated, but it doesn't become official. So it's a good thing it happened, but it just isn't getting written, written into law. The last piece, Ford does complete the withdrawal from Vietnam for the United States and then Vietnam South Vietnam is conquered by North Vietnam like we went over in 1975. So he kind of sees the end of the Vietnam War. Overall, these kind of get overshadowed by the domestic policy. Um, even though he had some successes in foreign policy, the economy was so bad that no one really cared about the detente stuff. Nobody really cared about the Helsinki Accords because people were more worried about jobs. So kind of the question that you want to think is, think about is why did Ford have such a difficult time as president? Um, the, the Why did, even though he was pretty successful in foreign policy, why was he seen as a failure as a president because of the domestic issues in the country? So then we jump to President Carter. So President Carter defeats Ford pretty easily in the election. Ford wasn't super popular. Um, he, remember, he was vice president, so a lot of people didn't really think that he should be leading the country at all. Um, the reason that Carter is so popular, and we're going to see this, is he is what's called an outsider. Um, this is what people called Donald Trump before he was elected as well. The idea is that he wasn't in politics. He was had been a governor 
just once. Um, he wasn't in politics. It's like he wasn't corrupted by the system. Um, he's very much a citizen's president. He's kind of a person like the average man. The issue is he is extremely inexperienced. And we're going to see that's going to be a major problem, especially with how he handles other nations. So Carter faces kind of the same thing as Ford. He faces an extremely divided nation. He faces a bad economy, and he still has to deal with the Cold War all at the same time. So we start with domestic policy again. Um, just like Ford, where he pardoned Nixon, um, Carter pardons or grants amnesty to anybody who avoided the draft during the Vietnam War. So a bunch of guys ran to Canada, or they kind of hid in America so they didn't get drafted. And he just says, we're not going to prosecute you. The government is not going to send you to jail. You can come back and live normal lives. It's super unpopular. Because even though the Vietnam War was unpopular, a lot of people still felt it was kind of your duty if you got drafted to join. The other issue that he has, the economy continues to sink. Um, inflation skyrocketed under him. Um, it got even worse. That's because there's another oil crisis that happens. So if you look up here, um, lines at this golf station to get like two gallons of gas. Um, that is because, and again, we're going to go over this a little later. That is because of the Iranian revolution. Iran has a revolution. The U.S. friendly dictator in Iran is overthrown and Iran instantly becomes an enemy of the United States and they stop selling us oil. Um, this causes gas prices to just absolutely skyrocket. The Community Reinvestment Act, um, it was supposed to be something to make banks give loans to people who were, and this is the key piece, low income, and it would let them buy homes. And the idea is that provides jobs, that gets people into homes, it kind of kickstarts the economy, but that low income piece is what makes this an issue. Um, these people couldn't afford their loans. Banks were giving out loans to people who couldn't afford them. And then what we're going to see, it contributes to what we call the Great Recession in 2008. All these people had loans. They shouldn't have gotten these loans. When the economy gets bad in 2008, they all lose their homes. And eventually, the economy collapses even worse. So while he had like good intentions on a lot of this stuff, it didn't work in actual practice. So for foreign policy, um, Carter wants to focus on human rights. He says that the United States supports too many dictatorships in its like quest to beat the Soviet Union. So the United States needs to focus on supporting human rights, supporting good leaders, supporting democracy. Um, so what he did was he tried to pursue that detente with the Soviet Union. And he kept doing that. They kept negotiating. There kept being summits, meetings between the two leaders. But then everything changes in 1979 when the USSR invades Afghanistan.
So this event changes kind of the Cold War, and it shows that there is now a more aggressive Soviet Union. Um, a lot of people argue that this is because the United States in the 70s looked weak, so the Soviet Union decides to kind of go on the offensive. Um, foreign policy-wise, after this, Carter has to deal with a few major issues. Um, the countries we're mostly going to focus on are Nicaragua, Cuba, and Panama. So in Nicaragua, there were some communist, socialist, same thing, rebels. They overthrew this family called the Somozas, who were a U.S.-supported dictator. And it seems like it's another loss to communism. Afghanistan's been invaded. Now Nicaragua is falling. And it seems like Carter is losing the Cold War. In Cuba, um, Castro Fidel, the communist Cuban leader, just empties his prisons and he allows anybody to go to the United States from Cuba in what's called the Mariel Boat Lift. Um, this is not super popular with the American people because we a lot of American people feel like most of the people coming over are criminals from Cuba. So it makes Carter look bad again. And then the Panama Canal, and he ratifies the treaty to return the Panama Canal to Panama by 1999. Um, the United States had owned the Panama Canal. It was kind of the key piece of our military strategy. Like, like we talked about on Teddy Roosevelt, it allowed us to move our ships from coast to coast very, very quickly. And a lot of people were afraid that this was Carter like giving up American interests and not enforcing America being a strong country. Um, what this leads to overall is this down here. It made it seem like Carter couldn't handle international events. He couldn't handle other countries. It made him seem very inexperienced. And a lot of people are going to see in the election, they're going to vote for somebody who they think is very experienced. He did have some good victories, though. He had some things that he did very, very, very well. And um, one of those is the his handling of the Middle East, and especially with the Camp David Accords here. So the Camp David Accords, um, these were a peace plan between Israel and all of its Arab neighbors. They had fought multiple wars, all of which Israel had won, but they were very bloody. They were wrecking the economy in that area. Um, and the idea was get Israel and the leader of the Arab world, which was Egypt, to sit down and talk. And the Camp David Accords do that. On the other hand, in the Middle East, and this is one that if I was you, I would star or highlight because this explains our modern relationship with Iran, is the Iran hostage crisis. So in the 50s, the United States over support, or, sorry, supported the overthrow of Iran's president, and we put this guy, the Shah, in charge. And the Shah was a dictator. And he ran Iran with an absolute iron fist, used secret police, executed people, concentration camps, everything you can think of. But he supplied the United States with lots and lots of cheap oil. Um, but in 79, he is overthrown by, and the key piece here is an, an Islamic revolution. Iran becomes an Islamic governed country by Ayatollah Khomeini. And the Shah ends up fleeing to the United States, where we let him in the country where he can live here as a refugee. And he had to get cancer treatment. So we were going to treat him for cancer. What happens? Khomeini, uh, Khomeini's supporters overtake the U.S. Embassy, and they take the staff of the United States Embassy hostage for 444 days, pretty much in the entire end of Carter's career. He tried to organize a rescue effort with using U.S. Special Forces. The helicopters ended up crashing in the desert and killed a bunch of U.S. servicemen. He couldn't get negotiations to get the hostages back. It makes him look weak. It makes the United States look weak. And it ends up being an absolute embarrassment for Carter. Um, what will eventually happen is the day Ronald Reagan takes office after Carter is defeated in the election, the hostages are released. And it's kind of the biggest embarrassment to Carter. And it's going to be one of the reasons that he is not reelected as president. So this video on here, you can watch it on your own time with the what's uploaded. This is just the kind of explanation of the Iran hostage crisis makes it make a little bit more sense. So the significance of both of these 
Um, what we are seeing during this time period is we are seeing a shift in U.S. foreign policy, member dealing with other countries, to the Middle East. We're seeing a shift towards the Middle East. Um, the United States is less focused on Europe, less focused on Asia, and the Middle East becomes more of the issue. We're going to see terrorism be starts to become a problem during this time period as well. There is less focus on the Cold War. Um, What's going on in the Soviet Union during this time is they are also having economic problems. And we don't know it yet, but theirs, theirs are even worse than ours. They're actually having issues feeding their country. So both countries start to kind of look inward instead of facing each other as much. One thing for the 80s that you, we ha are going to have to focus on is the rise of conservatism. This is the modern conservative movement um, that, that kind of flavors the Republican Party to this day, and that goes along with the distrust of the federal government. Um, the U.S. government is not looked at as a good thing. Um, this is the holdover from Vietnam, Watergate, the rise of the conservatives, and that's going to really lead us into like our modern politics. Um, I know the 80s and 90s seems like a long time ago, but really, historically, they're not, and we're still living with a lot of the effects from that time period. So I hope this helps on the 1970s. I hope you got some good notes from it. And if you have any questions, let me know.